There it is. Hey, everybody. Uh, once again, thanks for joining us today. We are glad you took time out of your busy Thursday to come and be a part of what uh, what God is doing here at Forward Focus Thursday. As always, we're excited to have you, happy to have you. I uh, want to thank our marvelous uh, technical support team for all that they do. Brother Alan Lavender, Reverend Sandra Pace, Sister Letitia Frey, and the whole team that just make sure that this uh, that this goes smoothly and goes well, which it always does. Want to thank um, our marvelous panel every week. We're all on together. Um, Reverend Stephen A. Cousin Jr., his dad, Reverend Stephen A. Cousin Sr., uh, my brother, Reverend Philip R. Cousin Jr., Bishop, my dad, Philip R. Cousin Sr., Reverend uh, Dr. Michael A. Cousin is not able to be with us today. He may jump on a little bit later, but he had a pressing engagement today that he could not um, get out of, so we shout him out as well. And of course, to our viewers, our loyal uh, viewers and, and co-participants in this with us, we thank you so much. Really excited because I, I meet so many people and hear from so many people that watch us every single week, and it just blows my mind how many people are watching and how many people are blessed by this. So we pray that today we can be a blessing uh, to you as well. So as we open up and we begin today, um, since I love messing with my brother, Stephen, I'm going to ask my brother, Stephen, to open us up in prayer today. If you don't mind, Steve, <laughs> you're on mute. He's muted. Yeah, he says what you get. <laughs> yeah, we pray every morning at 6 a.m. at Trinity. So I'm delighted to be asked to pray. Let us bow our heads and unite our hearts in prayer. God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your manifold blessings. We thank you for your generous grace. And oh God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that you've allowed us to come together in this venue so that we might do those things and say those things that would help make the church all that you would have it to be. Now, as we decrease, we pray that the Holy Ghost increase within us so that all that is said and done in here today might be pleasing in your sight, and we'll be careful to say you did it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, Steve. Um, if it looks like we're having fun on here, we are having fun on here because we all we all mess with each other um, all the time, and uh, especially my brother Steve. It's not a day that goes by he doesn't call and, and start some mess with me about something. So we really do, uh, what you see on here is real. We really do have a good time when we're with each other. And my nephew, his son is the same way. It must be in that in that um, in that branch of the bloodline. It must be just just starting mess with me because his son does the same thing. But I'm excited about today's topic. But before we get to it, let's go around the horn and see how everybody's doing. We'll start off with the, from the youngest, as we always do, to the oldest. Uh, Steve Jr., what you up to? No, I'm hanging in there. Um, we had a flash flood in the Northeast that just seemed to come out of nowhere. Uh, but, you know, thankfully, my church is relatively okay, just a little bit flooding in, in our basement. But, you know, pray for New York, New Jersey, and parts of Philadelphia, where a tornado actually touched down a mile away from where my mother works. And so she actually had to stay, you know, in her, in her workplace until they were given the all clear. So, you know, just, it, it's amazing. Hurricane Ida, that's my grandmother's name. So, um... Not only did she affect Louisiana, but she came all the way up here um, to affect the Northeast. But, you know, a little bit of sweet. Tomorrow I'll be celebrating 10 years of marriage um, to my wife, Christina Dickerson. So very thankful for that 10 years ago till tomorrow, really, um, where I said I do. And I believe most of us here were actually in Nashville. So praise be to God for that. Amen. Again, I'm thankful to be here with my brother Joseph and uh, my father, my brother Phil, and my son Steve as we do those things. And hopefully uh, this will help someone uh, and answer some questions that are, that are burning in your heart concerning the church. So I'm just glad to be here. Praise God. I, I likewise uh, resonate with that. I'm very happy to be here as well with my with my brothers, my nephew, and my father. Uh, I want you to, I ask that you pray for Northern California um, and uh, to the Northeast of where I'm in Sacramento, the, the Tahoe Resort area, where the fires are now, um, have now encroached and are, and are burning up uh, resorts. 
and forcing people out of uh, the, the Tahoe uh, area basin. Please pray for them. The, that uh, that Caldor fire is raging out here. Uh, we're going to give, going to give, give, give thanks to God for allowing us to come through and pray that those persons who are affected by what's happened. I, I look in our church and uh, look at look at the districts that are affected. The eighth, the third. I tell you. The, 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 the 16th, the 13th, the 5th, all affected by some kind of bad weather. It, it you know, you, you, you talk about this, maybe if, if, if I were a Hebrew, I say God sending more plagues <laughs> to, to, get, to get his people in order. They, they, won't, they won't listen to what God has said. They won't follow. So now he's sending plagues and I've never seen so much disaster come one right after the other. You get out of one and you're right in another. Think out of one and before that one ends, the other one comes, wham. We have had a, a year of disasters and a special summer of super disasters. So we're praying that God will show us what we must do in order to help bring some kind of sanity to this crazy, crazy culture in which we live. Okay, and, and Mike, uh, Mike, he was able to join us, y'all. So we're just going around the horn, Mike, and seeing what's going on with everybody. Um, good, yeah, hello. Just decompressing after dealing with compilations and the and the new discipline. Um, of some of the things I jotted down, we had about ninety-one bills presented, proposals, fifty-five prepared by revisions to be presented to the general conference. Seven bills passed out of nine being presented out of that 55. Mm. And so <laughs> it was an easy process this morning of just dropping stuff in. And, uh, you know, we should maybe have the book of discipline much quicker than we did with the last one uh, due to the process as well as not many bills that be put in. So my morning has been with uh, compilations today. So uh, pray much for Isaiah for what I can see. <laughs> what we Amen. Uh, Michael, did, did, you, did you get the wording about at the, all the thing at the close of this, of this legislature any, any wording that confuses will be left out. Did that come up to you? Yes, uh, yes, the chair made that known to us, Bishop Few. I know he did. And so I know he, I, he, I know he did. I know, I know I, he did. I, so he made that known because there are some things that conflict. Like one bill yeah. you have here that speaks about annual conference composition uh, local elders, uh, local deacons and, and de uh, elders being a part of the annual conference. No, no. But mm. that's, that's a bill, but that, but that went through the general conference. And nobody caught that. I mean, we put it in, in, in revisions. We ask about that wow. but in revisions. The only thing that we have to do is to try to be as impartial, I hope you notice, as impartial as possible. And hopefully that'll be caught on the floor. Nobody caught that on the floor. So now you have a conflict there in terms of, um, you know, the wording in it, it speaks about those persons being a part of the annual conference. So they can vote now? Well, that's gonna be up for interpretation. And you know how well we interpret. So that so says does that now, mean, the, the we Dr. Does that mean that some bishops might allow them to vote and others might not? Is that well, yes. what I'm hearing? Yes, yes, yes. That's yes, ridiculous. Yes. That is just about I can say that now, but uh, you know, that was action for the floor. Nobody caught it. Nobody caught it. So now, that does that also mean the leadership Dr. Cousin, we had. Dr. Yes. Cousin, does that also mean that locals can serve as delegates to the general conference? It leads for interpretation. Okay, I'm I'm clear. I'm it all right. It leads for interpretation. Yeah. 
for it. I'm trying to find it right now. I, I say, Lord, um, I'm just going, uh, I'm going, you know, also that comes up with transfer to another annual conference where that which you brought about, Bishop Cousin, about the bills, <laughs> where it may be in conflict. But in terms of, um, I'm trying to find, I don't mean to take up most of your time, please excuse me for that, but it's just that um, it, is, it, it is something that it's, it's, it's really, it, it, it's really mind boggling when you have persons who are to interpret the discipline but don't catch these things on the so, floor. So Dr. Cousin, Dr. Cousin, that also means that locals can transfer to another annual conference. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, uh, yeah, if they are part of the composition of the annual oh, conference. Oh boy, this is messed up. No, it, it, it cannot be because you got, you got one word in the other law which will prohibit it. It says itinerant. Now, and that that would do for the election because I, to be a delegate to the general conference, you must have been an itinerant elder, of four years good and understanding. Now, as long as that word stays in her itinerant, in transferring an itinerant elder who has no mark against character or any ruling can be transferred to another conference. An itinerant, as long as that word is in there, <laughs> as long as that word is in there, it, it, you can't well, do it. May I say this, Bishop Cousin, to you? As Edward is going to be in the book of discipline as decided by the 51st General Conference, annual conference, the composition. Here it is. Now, this is something that's that's public record. It's, I mean, we have the, the annual conference shall be composed of all traveling elders and deacons, including chaplains, all local elders and deacons and presidents of conference lay organization and women's missionary society and the conference directors of Christian education, MCAM, Women in Ministry, Sons of Allen, YPV, RAEC, COM, SWAB, uh, CDMC and all other conference level leaders of connection organizations together with one elected lay member and at least one elected lay person between the ages of 18 to 35 when possible from each charge within its bounds. Michael, you, you still, you still, the first word you said, all traveling, you don't travel unless you're itinerant. There again, there again is, there again is, 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 is your, is your leverage, is your leverage all traveling. You, re, you read that, re, start. All read traveling again, all elders and deacons and, deacons and are, it's no, but, but see, I mean, it's going to be printed. It's going to be all, printed. All, 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 all traveling. You, you don't travel unless you're itinerant. That's that's not necessarily true now because I know local elders who actually pastor now. So you know, know, what said, I'm telling you, I'm telling yeah. you, Bishop Cousin, who was elected the 96th Open to interpretation. Consecrated. This is what passed at the 51st session, and it says all local elders and deacons. Is that right. they, they may be members of the annual conference, but they but they cannot become representatives of the annual conference when it goes to the general conference. Well, uh, I see well, you that's, looking that's, color perplexed. That's, I'm that's, sorry that's, to take the subject and hijack it, but I'm sorry. No, that's, <laughs> I, that's, oh, I, I wanted to ask you, Michael, do you remember uh, from whence that bill came? Yes. Yes. Um, Are those new glasses, Phil? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like them. They look good. It comes from the legislative team of the Atlanta North Georgia Conference. <laughs> All right, Joe. A Dr. Cousin? Dr. Joseph Cousin? Oh, I'm sorry for laughing. Oh. I know this is recorded. Yes. I, I wasn't no, I, I wasn't privy to that. I wasn't on that team. In revisions, we have we 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 try to be as impartial as possible, <laughs> and there are times when you have some subjectivity, but we hope that it is ironed out on the floor. There are persons who will be more knowledgeable on the floor to catch certain things in debate, 
That's what we do with Robert's Rules of Order. However, uh, what we see here, when you have um, less time for debate and more expectations to try to satisfy, things like this occur. So, now, you satisfy, said Michael, Michael, you, 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 left, you left a dangling thought, satisfy. The, 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 the issue is when you, when you expand the annual conference, that means more people come. When more people come, you have more opportunities to do the things that are necessary. The, one of the major points in an annual conference is the raising of revenue to sustain that annual conference during yeah. the interim. Now, when you expand wide open the doors, you leave everything there. It it is it leads into our our subject for today, <laughs> because, <laughs> be, be, because, be, because because we are not recognizing the difficulty we place on people who do not want to be part of an organized institutional frame of religion. Okay, well, wait, Dad, let me let me introduce the topic, Dad, because uh, you're exactly right. So, and I'm, I'm going to give it back over to Dad. So here's today's topic. Today's topic, y'all, is um, the SBNR or SBNA movements. And for those that are familiar, it is the spiritual but not religious or spiritual but not affiliated movement. And it's basically people who claim to be spiritual, claim to love God. Uh, many, I believe, and it depends upon their their um, their uh, focus. But for us, it would be even even those that love Jesus, that believe in Christ, but don't affiliate themselves with any religious institution. And part of the reason they don't do that is because of what we've talked about these last 10, 15 minutes about church stuff. So today we're going to just talk about debate, outline that whole movement of spiritual but not religious or spiritual but not affiliated and um, and its effect on the church. Um, and we're gonna start uh, right now. So dad, go right ahead and finish what you were saying. I just want to introduce it. The, the, the difficulty comes because mo the more we confuse what the institutional church is all about, the less we get responses from those persons who somehow see through what many are trying to do. And it is, it is almost impossible to be spiritual and not have some way to have your spirit move in an organized fashion if you're working for the kingdom of God. But this is a cop out for those who don't want to be bothered and those who really don't want to claim any kind of affiliation with religion at all. They say they, they don't, I trust in God, but I don't trust in the church. I trust in God, but I don't believe in the church. I see what's happening in the church. And as a result of that, we are losing far faster than we're gaining. When you, when you look the way that the numbers have increased in the population, and it, instead of increasing with us, that the, the, the law of dimension re returns has taken full force of us and we're losing. That's because we are not always what we say we are when we focus right. ourselves on not mm -hmm. stressing the fact that the institutional church is the instrument through which the spiritual church operates. So then we must be more transparent in what we do. When you look at the discipline, where 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 are the financial figures? Where, 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 where's the budget? That's a that's a separate entity now that's been taken out. And when people feel like that the cover is, is, is being pulled over them, you know, then sooner or later they're gonna tug at that cover and pull it off. They want to know. People want to know. And, and I believe in my heart and soul, until we become more transparent in what we do, the church will continue to be what we don't want it to be. And that's empty. Fair. That, that's a good point, Steve. Well, I I I, I think one of the indications, <laughs> one of the songs that we, that that we played in church, the persons often sing, "Tamil the man, take me to the king." 
And in the first verse, she has there, I'm all churched out, hurt and abused. I can't fake what's left to do. And further down, she speaks about uh, religion, not really uh, being a part of being able to satisfy her spiritual self. So uh, I think persons played that in the church and it resonated because you have a lot of those who are sitting in the pews that feel as if it's now a game more so than worship. Um, and, and, and in terms of, we say we're inclusive, but we exclude folk. We say uh, transparency, but we hide. So it's a, it's a, it's a layer there, uh, a veneer that hides our own hypocrisy that I think James Baldwin says, but it's not, it's not what you say, but it's what I see you do. Um, maybe it is, a, it is a point at which um, persons where we spend a lot of times, for instance, with our last general church meeting, we spend a lot of time on minutia and we've come out just as confused, wondering what have we achieved? What do we take back to our people that would say that we are the better for it and we are prepared to lead them uh, into the next year or into the next uh, generation? Uh, have we improved ourselves? And it's just Sometimes folks see that we don't have our own act together that, you know, they say, why should I be involved in that? Let me just bring my two cents in, you know, to what, you know, dad and Uncle Mike was saying. I think granddad, you said it, and I heard other bishops say it, uh, where find something for the people to do or the people will begin to work on you. And I think what happened is during this time where if the churches I have a direction or a vision that people are, can actually be in alignment with, they began to work on each other. And I think that's where church hurt comes in, where a lot of, you know, especially those my age and, and younger will say that they left the church because of some traumatic experience they had uh, within the church. Maybe somebody gave them a wrong look or they the church was not there when a loved one passed away for whatever reason. And that, in itself caused them to actually not actually join an, another church or be affiliated with another church. They still wanna have their relationship with God, but not with the church because of the people inside. But we really have to ask ourselves, what is the church today? Are, are, are you really there to be spiritually fed? Or are you there because you wanna be driven to a higher power and you want to, to do more? A lot of people tell me, Listen, I've already had a rough week. I don't need you to preach conviction. I need you to preach me happy for two hours. Let me forget about my problems. And then I'm, I'm give me something through for, for the week. But to me, that's not church. So my question is, is it what is the church? What is the church's role in, in today's society? What factors do we play? I just see us more as a social club, you know, as exclusive membership. Um, where yeah. some churches, depending on your profession, how much money you make, um, you, you are admitted. It, 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 uh, uh, skin color, you are admitted. Um, but if you're anything outside of those norms, you look as other than, and you start getting looks at what makes you, you know, want to come here. Who invited you? It, it's like we say, come as you are, but it's really, it has to be invite only. You have to show your invitation at the door. Which member brought you in? before we fully embrace you. If we just come in off the street and people look around who invited that person, that's where you start to get this spiritual but not religious. Sometimes religion can actually divide us. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, but I'll just end it right there. I want to get back, I want to get back to what, uh, to what daddy said first about, uh, about the spiritual but not religious or spiritual but not affiliated being a cop out. Uh, and I would ask the question, what do you call an astronaut that doesn't believe in rocketry? <laughs> you see, the answer, the answer would have to be, I don't know what you call them, but you surely can't call them an astronaut. So nope. I can't call anybody Christian that does not believe in nope. no, Christian no. church. Uh, uh, sec secondly, when we talk about spiritual but not affiliated, 
being a new banner that people are waving in in today's society, we need to understand that the, the spectrum of what is religious embraces far more than what we consider to be orthodox Christianity. Uh, the, the spectrum now of being religious embraces uh, all kinds of, of pantheistic uh, worships. Uh, we, we are no better today than Paul was on the hill of Acropolis. We have everything except an idol to the unknown God that people are out here worshiping now. Even within what we consider to be Orthodox Christianity, you've got a spectrum that runs all the way from universalism and Unitarianism to, uh, to, to Orthodox Methodism, Episcopalianism, and they're, they're radically, radically different. Let, let me let me jump in for a sec, Phil. I want you to and everybody to comment on this. I think Phil brought this to my attention. Um, tell him, Phil, about the article you sent us about about Harvard. Oh, I sent that I sent that out uh, because uh, someone sent it to me that uh, the, the 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 head, the chief of, of of chaplains now at Harvard University is an atheist, and and that that's a that's an oxymoron, an atheist chaplain. What are, you, what are you believing in? Atheism means that you do not believe in God. It is, it is our theos. It is an alpha privative. It, it, it means I don't believe in God. By definition, there's no such thing as an atheist because philosophically, one has to believe in order not to believe. One cannot not believe in that which is not. It must, you must first, the first condition, the precondition, of making that argument would have to be belief. And so to say there is no God, one must first presuppose that there is a God, which is a contradiction. So atheism is a contradiction, just like agnosticism, which is another <laughs> rampant branch out here in, in among religious people. And, and hey, Phil, uh, just like just like uh, reverse race, just like reverse race. An agnostic, an agnostic it confesses, I don't know there is a God, but that word agnosis is the basis of our word ignorance. So when you call yourself an agnostic, you're saying I'm ignorant. I don't know. It's like no it's knowledge, like people, no knowledge. Just like Lack of claiming, knowledge thereupon, yes. No it's like I'm claiming reverse racism. There's no such thing. No. You, you, one, one of our difficulties is religion happens to be the organized vehicle which carries the spiritual life that you find in the God you serve to do the things that are required of you. Religion is, is how you tie yourself with, with your spiritual aspect. But now, what, what happened to us? Imagine that you bought a Model T Ford. And now in this day and age, you try to compete on, on the freeways with a Model T Ford that's going on by you, and you say, I don't want to be bothered with no car. Now, how far do you think you would go? Not at all. What, yeah. one, 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 of the danger, one of the dangers we have is, ask people what's wrong with the church. The first thing they come up with is, all you want is money. Right. All you want is money. Now, where do they get that from? Because Poor folk always say, we ain't got enough money. And, and one of the things that, that hides us behind the shield of ignorance is the fact that we claim all the church wants is money. They don't want nothing but money. But we don't, we don't have enough money to even keep ourselves afloat. It, I wonder how, how we're going to stay afloat. In these districts, we got all these problems now. How are we going to stay afloat? But we 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 haven't changed our vehicle for transportation in our religious frame from the Model T that we had with Richard Allen up until now. It is different. It. I talked to some folk about class meetings the other day. Folk don't know what class meetings is. Talk about love feasts. They don't know what that is. They talk about the duties. Of, of the official board, the duties of the stewards. They don't know what that is. We we still we still are not ready to recognize that the car that we had it done wore out. We got to make some adjustments. We need we need to take our religious vehicle to the to the polity shop and begin to tie in 
the polity from our doctrine to make sure that our religious vehicle will roll in conjunction with what our polity is based upon how we draw it from the doctrine which makes us spiritual. Doctrine makes us spiritual. When, when, we, get, when we get the doctrine and the belief that we are, that makes us spiritual. When we get to be that way, then we get to be religious because when I get to be spiritual, I want to spread what I know to others. That's where my religion comes in. So you, you, it, it's hard to say I am spiritual, but not religious. You ain't got nothing because the basis, the basis, the basis of, of, of what we have and where we are is understanding that, that the thrust of being spiritual is to make certain that you put your life and, and let praxis come into being. Let people see what you are and know what you are. And that's done through the religion that you profess is based upon the polity that you have drawn from the doctrine that you have when you found Christ Jesus. And Joe, I want to get back to that article that you sent out, the one that the one they talked about, uh, spiritual but not religious, spiritual but not affiliated. But one of the one of the primary sources in there that they cited was uh, well, they, they referenced an, an an author, philosopher, uh, theologian William James, and uh, William James wrote a book, uh, Varieties of Religious Experience, and and that's that's what I get to with this. There are varieties of religious experience but not all varieties are valid. There are varieties of religious experience, but not all of them are valid. There are people who see UFOs and the Loch Ness Monster, and they create a cultic kind of atmosphere around that, and they come to believe in that as seriously as people believe in orthodox organized religion. As a matter of fact, on some spectrums, that's considered a variety of religious experience, but that does not make it a valid variety. And so we, we, you know, we, we want to, to focus on what keeps people grounded in Christianity. And as daddy just said, that's th that your, your, your validation of religious experience is in your affiliation with the church, the body of Christ. You can't, you can't be out here, uh, religious in isolation. It, it's antithetical to what religious experience, valid religious experience is all about. Valid religious experience is rooted and grounded in communion. You gotta be with somebody, like-minded, like-minded folk, folk who are trying to work out their own soul salvation in fear and trembling. That's what it's about. And this this other out here becomes uh, an, an eclectic approach. You know, I'm going to do this because I like this. I'm going to do this because I like that. I'm not trying not to denigrate anybody's religious experience, but I know people who, when asked why they're Catholic, they say because it's a pretty religion. Okay, wait. Now, let me let's 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 transition for a second. So, what I'm hearing is spiritual but not religious is, for lack of a better word, is anarchy. It's an oxymoron. It's basically, no order. It's, it's oxymoron. No order. Okay, so. It's oxymoronic and, and it, it, it makes no sense, has no order. Okay, so that being said, then what should the church's response be to this dilemma? Um, Reverend Pace asked a question. She asked a question. She said, um, do you think that things that the church has not sanctioned, but have been sanctioned, um, and I'm, I'm adding this part, but have been sanctioned by society, such as alternate lifestyles, influx, of other religious movements and those things, has that had an effect on organized religion and a spiritual but not religious movement? Because our whole thing being forward focused, you know, we do try to press forward and move forward. How do we as a church then address this because um, we're, we're losing uh, or have lost that group uh, where the parents still come to church, maybe the grandparents come to church, but now the kids aren't coming to church and, and the kids are growing up because that group that's, that's, this is really hitting is probably right below you, Steve Jr. And Steve Jr., if, can, may I tell your age, Steve, you care? Oh, I'm, I'm part of that group. Well, I, I think they're a little bit younger than you too, though. I think they, 
Cut you get old now, Steve. You're 38, boss. I think they cut out around 34, 35. I think they just under you, doctor. You're a little old now, but nevertheless, oh, um, oh. nevertheless, though. But 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 how? So how do we as a church address that? How do we do it? One of the things, one of the things that, that we we fail to recognize, we have allowed culture to become doctrine in the church. We we have allowed the the what what you just mentioned, some of the things that have been accepted and and used and allowed in the in the culture, now become a part of the doctrine of the church, inclusion, full inclusion. Well, if I'm going to fully include, I include all sinners. But that you know, you 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 got to make some kind of distinctions. There there, there has to be some way in which we recognize that the culture in which we live cannot determine the doctrine of our faith. Cannot determine how we see God, how we serve God how we believe in God. The culture will call, just like what Philip had mentioned, all the different things you see, yeah, they might they might see the moon, they might see a rocket ship, they might do this, they might, that might become their God. But we cannot allow the culture to push us off. I like to think that we need to keep some guardrails in our, in our religion based upon what we believe out of our spiritual ascension into the understanding of what God has for us and is to us. So that we have some guardrails that will not allow us to go adrift and off and allow to take too many exit ramps when culture comes in. Like, you know, the question that you have to deal with pretty soon is what, what are we going to do when it does hit the floor about fully opening the church to all lifestyles, it doesn't matter what kind of lifestyle you have, it's open. All lifestyles can become ordained clergy. All lifestyles, so now that, those are questions we have to answer. Those are questions we're gonna to have to, how are we going to measure our answer based upon the doctrine in which we believe or based upon the culture in which we find ourselves. Hmm. I, I just want to say this to y'all. I'm laughing because I did a little research. Basically, it may be like this in many states, but in the state of Georgia now, basically you don't have to do anything to perform a, a marriage ceremony. And here it says, um, the Georgia state government does not license, register, or certify ministers or wedding officiants. So once you sign up with one of these agencies and there are many different ones out there you don't have to do anything but sign up with them pay a fee and you can perform um, a wedding ceremony right right so once wasn't again that, wasn't that the fall of, of, of solomon you know he had he had uh what 700 wives and 300 concubines was that what it was and 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 they they brought all their idols with them and then he, he he got to dabbling in that we, we got we have too much stuff going on in the ame church we have we we have we we have become what what we see in others to be great and it's not great at all we brought all this junk in now we have to figure out how we're going to sort it out that's that's what i, I think, see but i think that's where you know the overall point is like we definitely have an identity crisis who, who are we and, and where, what do we want to be and where do we want to go? I don't think that's really been addressed. I just think that right now it's like basically a flavor of the month where we look around, we see what we think is working temporarily and we try to incorporate it because it seemed to be like the end thing. But to me, for those people who do that, they don't have an identity in themselves. They don't know who they are. So as, as an AME church, who are we? Um, I, I don't think we really know the answer to that question. Like, what, what, what are we? Mm. And until we really address that, even though it says in the discipline, um, what we think it has spelled out, I don't think it's been properly interpreted. Where it's it's universal, where you can have you know twenty different interpretations, and based off the local pastor, it could be another interpretation. 
So until there is one universal um, policy in terms of who we are, what we are, and actually understand our identity, we're always going to be talking around in circles about what can we do next. Well, I, I like to say that um, in terms of, of identity, I think it has to be a, a session, a truth session, because it's already there um, in terms of questioning identity. At our general conference, when the resolution was brought up about the same-sex language, the proponent, the major pusher of it, who read it, identified herself as being, um, I'm not too sure of the term, but she's, I think just say queer. And she's a delegate, she's ordained, um, she's pastoring. So I think that now we have to look at the fact that it's, it's, it, 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 it is among us. We can no longer ignore it. It's gonna be a trying conversation, but one that's necessary in order for us to see where we are, where we stand. There may be some gains, may be some losses, but I think getting back to your point, Joe, about uh, the generations, you know, it, it is a cultural thing where, you know, our, our, our system is based on numbers. If you, if you, how many preachers do you know that preach just sound doctrine, but they, they don't see the accessions or the conversions and what happens to those persons? get cut off they get sent to patmos <laughs> you know and so but for those who have a lively appealing that's the word appealing appealing is like a spiritual opiate what happens to those persons they get pushed to the front but what happens like chocolate it becomes milk chocolate it becomes what dilute it, it comes diluted it becomes watered down it becomes appealing and so now I think it's just that we need to recognize that this is a conversation that is long overdue because we need to recognize some things that we've been ignoring. I don't think we've been ignoring it, Michael. Our problem is that we will not maintain our, our posture, which we, who we say we are. We, 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 have, we have maintained, if, if, if you don't say who you are, anybody can come in and take over. I've been in the ministry and in this world long enough that if you would have ever told me that I see a Baptist preacher calling himself Bishop wearing purple, I'd have laughed. <laughs> I would have laughed, downright laughed, if you would have told me that I would see a Church of God in Christ preacher with a robe dressed like this, I would laugh. I said, that ain't, that ain't, that. they were called holy rollers. But now what happened? They began to get numbers and we did not adjust and adapt. And what we did, they thought we were doing well. They took all of our stuff. We took all of their stuff. They are growing and we're dying. We, who would have heard of a praise team? I, mean, I, I never had no praise team when I was growing up. A praise team? You, you had hard to get a praise team at a prayer meeting. You had no praise team in, 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 for your opening service. You, 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 you had, we, we have lost, you talk about identity. We don't know who we are. We've, we've, lost, we've lost our identity. The AME church has to begin to take a look at itself and see who we are, what do we believe in, what keeps us going, what generates the enthusiasm in the members we have so that they can say, yes, I am spiritual and I am religious. I am going to let my spirit push my religiosity to the point where I'm going to try to spread it to all that I meet. But we, we, we haven't come to that yet. I hope we will. I mean, it's a, it's a sobering discussion because ultimately it does get down to, to identity. 
what, what, what defines us? Because if we will not define ourselves, then we'll be defined by everything else around us. And we endanger our identity every time we allow something to creep in. And it's insidious. It does not come all at once. It encroaches like, like watching the ocean erode a beach. And so you look up and one, and, the, and one day you're standing up for the reading of the gospel. You, you, you look up again and you're, you've got uh, a processional coming into worship led by praise dancers who are doing everything but throwing flower petals and, and, and waving fronds. You know, you, you, you know you, your, your identity gets called into question because you feel like you have to continually remake yourself. My question is, how many times are we required to remake ourselves. I believe it is God who made us after God's own image, and it is God who remakes us when we are saved, and after that, it's done. Our task is to try and, and maintain that high standard of righteousness, a right standing into which Jesus has brought us. We are to be out here thinking of brand new ways to invent ourselves. But we treat Sunday morning worship now like a golden corral buffet line. And folk come in, they grab their little spiritual trade, and they walk down the line. I don't like this, and I don't like that, but I'm eating a whole lot of this. And then I'm going to go on about my business. And there's no balance. There's no, there's no balance. I think it's like the Burger King, it's the Burger King mentality. We want to have it our way. Yeah. So... You know, again, uh, we 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 try to get the numbers, and uh, we you know we 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 equate success with numbers, but then that number just because a church you know, every every big church is not healthy, and every healthy church is not big. Not big, uh, true. You know, so we you know we we look at it's like going to get with daddy we go shopping. And we would go shopping with mom and dad and we go get meat. And we see those big logs in plastic, right? <laughs> we learned the viable lesson. How many of us been thumped in the head for learning types of meat? They been raise your hand. You've been thumped. Come on, raise your hand. You've been thumped in the head for learning about the types of meat. Come on, Steve. <laughs> uh, and we see the big person. log. And we said, boy, to get that big log. And daddy would, you know, daddy would say, you know, dad, you know, daddy's terms. He said, no, that's not, that's not what you want. And you see ground beef, there's ground beef. No, that's not what you want. Ground chuck, okay, you get better. But what was it? Ground round. It wasn't as large. <laughs> it was better but quality. It, but it better quality, <laughs> right? Well, if I see you say, because I, I, I remember this, you know. Just like know getting the know. right kind of peaches in the right kind of no, no, I'm like, That's where I was going. <laughs> I was going to the right kind of peaches because I can remember being sent to the store and I come back with clean peaches in heavy syrup because the peach was a peach to me and get sent back. No, you go and get freestone peaches. You had to get freestone. And I had to actually look up, well, what in the world is a freestone peach and why is it different from a clean? Well, it's very different. Yeah. It's very different. And, and, and you, had to get, you, had, you had to get ground round and you had to get freestone peaches. And Phil, you, know, you had to get in that, the, ketchup. Don't get no hunts. Yeah, you know, no, the no, log no, no, looks no, no, big, no, right? <laughs> that that plastic yeah. log looks big, but what? But what's in there? Fat, gristle. Yeah, they take everything. a whole log just to make a little patty. But there was more in that ground round that oh, was in that plastic oh, no. log. Dad used to tell you in that you get that you get that beef in the log, see. And when you make your patty, cook it up. Watch how small it gets. It, watch out! Watch how it shrinks. Because it shrinks. It's fat it's, and gristle. Because there's nothing, nothing in it that's, that's of substance. Oh yeah, I, I, I think about that every time I go grocery shopping now. And and because what they do now with with the ground beef is, you know, you got uh, you got ground beef, and then you got seventy thirty, yeah, you got eighty twenty, and then you got ninety and ninety six. And when you get to ninety six, oh, you get to some good, you get to some good ground beef there because it means you got less fat, more substance. And that's what we got to do in the church. We got to learn how to recognize the difference between the filler and what's actually filling. But, but Phil, you know what? 
And on that same line, in that same line of thinking, as you said, Mike, about why churches with sound doctrine aren't growing, it's the same reason why the big log outsells the quality beef because it's cheaper. It costs more and it takes more sacrifice and takes more out of people to sit under sound doctrine and hear actually things in your life that you need to change as opposed to just hearing what's going to satisfy your itching ears. And therefore, the people will flock to the, the gristly, fatty, um, you know, gospel that is going to give them what they think they want, as opposed to something that's more lean and, and sometimes more, more, more difficult to deal with. Yeah, because that, that, that fatty burger smells real good on the grill. Absolutely. Oh, that fatty burger, that fatty burger. Oh, when that grease and that gristle starts to burning, you, you, can, you can smell that a mile off. And and so it smells real good. And then you get up on it and you look at your what? What is this? <laughs> what is this? It's visually appealing. It's visually appealing when you see yeah, a fatty right. log. And that's what it is. We're trying to appeal more so than we're trying to teach. Okay, so then, so then forward focus. Let's say this then. Um, and, and Michael and I have this discussion all the time. By the way, um, fingers crossed, I think my brother Michael's coming to see me this weekend. Fingers crossed, though, because I don't know about Mike. Fingers crossed, but nevertheless. I hope he does. It's not a time to put family business out there like I that. I hope he does. You don't know who's listening, okay? It don't so matter. I'm proud my brother's coming to see me. I'm family business. So, that's all I got to say. I don't care. So this is what Michael and I talk about all the time. Um, we, we talk about the fact <laughs> that with the church and with um, doctrine and everything, then... Michael always says that the problem with the church is we're trying so hard to be what we're not and forgetting to be what we're called to be. So perhaps we need to stop trying to be, uh, with, with, uh, with all due respect to Paul, Phil, stop, stop trying to be all things to everybody in every situation, but learn to just do what we do well and, and move from there. Thoughts? Yeah, but our, but our church has always been numbers driven. Whether it's numerical numbers or financial numbers, it's just numbers driven. So we get caught up in getting people into the church by any means necessary. If that means uh, putting on a show, then it's showtime. You know, you have to do it because if you if you don't, then you run the risk of getting moved. And you can get moved every year. So you have to do, you know, you have to do something. You have to, you have to be practical. And I, I know people who lie about what they raise. And I'm talking about seriously lie because they're afraid. They're afraid. They lie about how many members they have because they're afraid. So you know, that's 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 my take on it right there. We have to. Yeah. And in the and in the church, let me just say this. I'm gonna I'm gonna shut up. In the church, in the in the AME church, let me put it like that. We have little time for anything else than raising money. Every six months, we have to come up with something, and we better come up with it, or else we'll be, or else we'll be judged accordingly. You know, and 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 we'll be we'll be sent to a church, you know, where we where we don't have to raise a lot of money because we haven't been raising a lot of money or taking in members. We just get shuffled to the side. So where's the spirituality in that? You can be you can be spiritual, you can be religious, you can teach Bible study, you can have all kinds of prayer meetings. But the truth of the matter is, if you have no members and you're raising a little money, you might as well get your hat, pack your bag, and prepare to leave. Why are y'all so quiet? I, I was just I was just going to say that uh, I had a you know, in, in terms of in terms of the preaching and 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 getting back to the, what Joe was called the notion of showtime. You know, I had a I had a presiding elder I loved dearly, God rest his soul, who used to chide me, saying, you know, Phil, every now and then in your preaching, you just got to uh, drop the script and cut across the cornfield. And after he told me that a couple of times, I just told him one day, I said, but elder, what if all I'm doing is cutting across the cornfield? What good is cutting across the cornfield if I emerge on the other side and I don't have a single ear of corn? Wow. Then I, I spent a wasted trip through the cornfield. If you're going to cut through the cornfield, you ought to at least have sense enough to grab you four or five ears on your way through. But if cutting through the cornfield still isn't yielding me any result, 
you know, the, 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 the point I want to make is, you know, folk don't really want the gospel today. What they want is gospel light. They want half the calorie, you know, they, they want uh, all the flavor with half the caloric content, you know, half the commitment. They, they want gospel light. And, and it just doesn't, it just doesn't exist. That might be what they want, but we are not, uh, it is not incumbent upon us to provide it. You know, the, 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 what, what, what one of you just called a little while ago, the, the, the feel good gospel. I think Steve Jr. said it. I just want to come and you make me feel good for a couple of hours. And then I go on my way. Uh, Daddy uh, talked about it this way one time. Daddy said, you know, they get, they get around the, uh, the dinner table Sunday after church and they go, oh, Pastor Shaw preached a good sermon today. But well, what did he say? I, I don't know what he said, but he sure preached a good sermon. And that sounds good. Good. So sounds sounds good. Good. That, that's the gospel light right there. When folk, all folk, when folk can remember, oh, you sure sounded good, but they don't remember a single thing you said. So I, I think it gets down to the point of identity where we borrow so much that we don't understand where we're borrowing it from, um, proclaiming that is that we are not just a borrowing, but we are adopting certain things from uh, understanding of liturgy, uh, understanding of doctrine, of preaching, um, you know, that we, that we have lost it in the process that we don't know where it comes from. I, I give you a case, um, the church I serve, we had two crosses on the communion table. Two. I said, I heard a three, but what, what's two? <laughs> so they were they're going through. I said, so I asked the steward, I says, why two? Um, did one of the thieves get redeemed? Or what, what's, what happened? I mean, did they forget? Uh, what's the other cross? Said, what do you mean? I said, you got two. But I went through the whole thing, the centrality of the cross, everything else. But I said, you know, let me stop. And so they would prepare the table and they would put that second cross at an at a, at a angle from the first one. And I, I talked to the stewards about it. No one really knew why I was on there, why I was, why I was there. So finally, after a week, one of the dear sisters came to me and said, Reverend, I must confess something. That was a gift from another church to us. They gave us one Sunday. And I left it on the table right there. And it's been there ever since. <laughs> and nobody ever moved it. <laughs> so I said, Oh, Lord. I said, sugar, God bless your little heart for telling the truth. I understand. Uh, so that's that's what we see within, you know, we we take stuff as gospel that, that doesn't belong to us. Hello, somebody. Am I talking? Is this thing on? Uh, that we don't understand what we do, <laughs> why we do from the church, from our liturgy. And Mike. To our preaching. Yes. To, to your favorite, your favorite, the split chancel. Oh. Um, <laughs> oh Lord, they don't even know what that means. Tell them, Mike. You Tell them. I'm going, I mean, you, I mean, for those you got, we got speaking on both sides. Which one you want to speak from, Reverend? Uh, Lord Jesus, have mercy. Um, do you understand the significance of this? No, we just had the church, we saw it in one church and it looked good. We wanted to have our church look like that too. Yes, sir. Appealing, but not understanding. Um, my head hurts. <laughs> my heart grieves. But, but, um, but, some, but sometimes, sometimes it's, it's hard though. And, and Dad, you can attest to this. Sometimes it's hard when you feel like you're the only one crying out in the wilderness for this stuff. When everybody else is just doing whatever they feel like doing, it's just it's a hard place to be. And I'm Dad. You've been there for years, so it's a hard place to be. Well, it's it, you know they tried. I when when I started. Back in 19, Joe, back in 1956, when I started my first church, old Reverend Gorman yeah. told me, boy, you better get you a, better get you a hoop. Because the, the, the folk want to hear a hoop. They, they don't want to hear all this. They, they want, want a hoop. They, they, want, they want to feel good. You better get you a hoop. I, I said, I ain't got no hoop. I ain't, you don't have no hoop. <laughs> So he said, you, 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 you better get you a hoop. All the good preachers got a hoop. And so that, that's what we base it on. And that was based upon making people have entertainment 
through the gospel, of feeling good through the gospel, getting a hoop. If you didn't have a hoop, I know some folk would wait, lucha along in New Orleans, Louisiana. Folk would time when to come to church about 10 minutes before he finished his sermon because all they want to do was hear that hoop. Said he got the sweetest hoop in town. <laughs> C.L. Franklin, C.L. Franklin, who got more folk messed up down at ITC trying to get the hoop. And who's that one that's crippled down here in Atlanta, the preacher that does, got the hoop now, got the boys all messed up down there with the hoop. Now, there's more, religion is more than entertainment. Preaching is more than entertainment. But when, 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 you go, when, when, when you go to the church and you want to be entertained, right there in Durham, Michael, my first Sunday in St. Joseph, my second Sunday, Noah Bennett told me, well, Reverend, well, you're a little bit different. I want you to know, we came to church not to hear the preach. We came to church to hear the choir. And, 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 and I said, what? And he said, yeah, so we, we came to church to hear the choir. We didn't think about no, we think about no sermon. So we didn't want to hear no sermon. And as a result of that, they had a very good choir, but folk sent up there writing notes, doing everything, doing the service, uh, because all they wanted to do was to hear the choir. That's entertainment. That ain't religion. That's entertainment. And that's, that's still carried on in a whole lot of places. They go to church to be entertained and not to be revived, not to be spiritually lifted and encouraged, but just to be made feel good. Like you're going to some concert, like you're going to some stage show, some play show, some carnival, they come out feeling good. Didn't they do it? Didn't they do something there? Oh, what'd they do? In, in my home lady class, Alan Knight Chalmers and E. Winston Jones, when they taught homiletics, one of my friends, who was the best man at my wedding, uh, George Ransom Tooks Reed, <laughs> when, 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 when he finished preaching his, his sermon, uh, as we had to preach in, in our homiletics class, E. Winston Jones told him, said, well, said, you sounded good, but you ain't said nothing. <laughs> He said, "You sounded good, but what did you say?" So, so, so I, I said, "Now that 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 you talking about, we're, we're at, that's where we are. People want you to sound good. They ain't come here about you what you what you what you say. They want you to sound good. They want you to entertain them, make them feel good. They ain't care about no. They ain't care about no spiritual uplift. They ain't care about no direction. Ninety percent of them, all they want to do is, oh, didn't they say something?" And then somebody get up and say, hallelujah, good Lord, Lord. What, and after, what did they say? I don't know. But, oh, we sure had a good time in church today. Oh, they were shouting all of them down the aisle. Why are they shouting? I don't know why they shouting, but it, it sounded good. We had a good time. And that's then my, sometimes, that's, that, that's and sometimes, I'm, huh? That's, I'm, I'm going to share this, Dad, and, and don't kill me for sharing this. Um, that's the reason why Dad and, and Stephen, too, for that matter, for the most part, both of them have wonderful singing voices, can sing. I wish I could sing like them. Can't, can't, can't carry a tune in the bucket, but they can, but beautiful singing voices. Dad, why don't you sing when you preach? Because I, that's all they want. Get tired of that. <laughs> it's, 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 you, 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 what, what you find yourself doing is short-terming yourself on your sermon. And, it, and most preachers, if they're gonna be truthful, they say, how am I gonna break, as Michael says, how am I gonna land this plane? And <laughs> how am I gonna land this plane? Now, now if if you can sing a good song, I, I, I can land my plane with this song and I ain't got to worry about it. Now, am I landed? Are they gonna clap? Are they gonna shout? What are they gonna do when I land my plane? So I don't want but just saying, come, come on, come on in now, come on in now, it's time to come in, time to come in. So that, that 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 preaching and doing cannot be determined. I, I I thank God for sending me to St. Joseph 
Because for 10 years, I ain't hear not one amen hardly. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and so it, it, it taught me that, that the sermon cannot be based on how many amens you get. It has to be based upon what effect it has on the people there that you're, that you're serving. Okay, look, we, we're gonna, we've been on over an hour. We're going to stop right here. But here's next Wait week. Joe, Joe, that I got to say this and that sure. is, and just, just to clear it up. Although he didn't hear any amens, there's still folk living in Durham that I that that I know that can remember the sermons he preached back from that time. And so they may not have heard amens, but they can tell you the sermon and the text and the sermons, how, he, how they affected his life. So I didn't want folk to think that uh, he didn't have a, a dynamic ministry um, at the church, similar to what Philip had there when Philip followed him. Uh, a dynamic ministry. So I uh, just want to put that, just want to drop that pin right there. Joe, 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 before you get to the next topic, I want to, I do want to add just one little point about it in terms of what we bring to the church as a, as a point of humor. You know, of all of the things that we allow to come in from the charismatics, there's one thing the charismatics do that I have yet to see in an AME church. And that is when the preacher is preaching, folk get up out of the pews and come down and throw money at the pulpit. They do that at AME churches now, Phil. At some I've of never, them. I've never seen it. I've seen it at some of ours. They do. They do. Yes. And I recommend, they do. Michael, I've the next it. time, the next time you meet with compilations, see if you can get that included as a codicil in the discipline. And then folk might start doing it. No, no, but how, yeah, how do we get that? How do we make that happen? This is the thing, though. This is the thing. Our members will go to another church. That's right. And and throw money. And, and, and make it rain in church. I'm just going to say it like they at the club, but come to your church. And if they see it being drought, drought, it'll be like it's the worst thing ever, but they'll go somewhere else and do it. Right. Well, I had uh, one of our cousins come over when I was pastoring in Coco. And he was a doctor. You, you know, the Bodie came. Yeah. And when he gave his offering, he also put in there, bless the man of God and put an additional $50. And when service was over, the finance committee came and asked me, Reverend, what, what do we do with this $50? We ain't never seen this before. He said, what's it say? It says, bless the man of God. So who do you think, what, what do you say? What do we do with it? I said, you give it to me. <laughs> I said, that's I right. can't, you know, that's how he was taught. He went to the assemblies of God, and they and and they do that. And so that's my money. Oh, we ain't never seen that. Just because you ain't never seen it, don't ask me. It ain't been done. Well, look, for, for next week's topic, <laughs> I'm, I'm putting it out there for everybody. Oh, for next week's topic, if y'all are okay with it, I think we need to do. We, we've we've dovetailed over. I think we're gonna do something along the lines of prophetic preaching in a pandemic place. Ooh. So how do we keep the preaching? both proficient and prophetic during this place of pandemic. I think that's going to be oh, good next week. Y'all get ready for, for those of us that watch and are watching all the preachers, all the pastors, everybody get on next week for prophetic preaching from a pandemic place. The former um, instructor of homiletics at Duke University and and a Duke few Divinity other school. halfway decent preachers, Duke Divinity School, yes, Duke Div School. And a few other halfway decent preachers are going to be on talking about this <laughs> next week. Prophetic preaching from a pandemic place. That's all I got to say. Hey, Joe, like, Joe just say, and say, you know, pity the frog that won't praise his pawn. Uh, not only did he teach at the Div School, but he was the first African American to be on staff. That's right. At the Div School. So we got to give props. This is uh, just something we just not, you know, hey, we in high cotton now. I mean, you know, yes. hey, amen. You go and sit there and he's going he's gonna to bless us with some, amen. Uh, some nuts. You know, you know, Mike, you're going to tell us to tell the Lord at the same, at the same time, what I, what I never been able to figure out, that it was also at the School of Religion at Carolina. Amen. That's right. That's right. That's right. So he taught the School of Religion at Carolina and at the Div School. So, um, you know, we had a discussion about people who lived out in Emory Wood. They were talking about the first person to do this, first person to do this, first person. I'd let them know, you know, you see, y'all see preacher, but we see pioneer, trendsetter, one that, you know, 
that pushed us. And we hope that others will glean from that and be blessed by it. Amen. Um, Amen. Steve Jr. stepped away. So uh, my, my comments, so again, thank everybody. Thanks, uh, Reverend Pace, Brother Lavender, Sister Frey. Thanks to Steve Jr., Mike, Steve Sr., Phil, Dad, everybody. And thanks to you all for watching us and making this um, one of the favorite parts of my week. We went a little long today, uh, but thank you for sticking on and hanging in there with us. Um, and I look forward to next week's topic as we talk about preaching in uh, the 21st century, especially in the season of pandemic. Mike? Um, just want to thank you all. And please share this with your family and friends. And it's always good to see uh, my family and just keep us lifted as we are uh, going through this time such as this. Yeah, I'm glad to be a part of the discussion. I too glad to be a part of the discussion. It's been, it's been great, a lot of fun. Thank God for the fact that uh, we had an opportunity to discuss the growth and development we need in order to keep the church vibrant and alive and moving. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this pleasure. And I thank God for allowing me to be able to see sons that I watch grow up, grandson that I watch grow up, become a vital part in the growth of the kingdom. God bless, God keep, God sustain us. Amen. 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 Thanks, everybody, as always. Please like and share this post with your friends and your network. Thank you. Amen.